This video is an overview of the American Airborne on D-Day, 101st Division and the 82nd Division. Now, there's lots of stories to tell and so there will be other videos about individual actions. So let's go. Now behind me on the skyline we can see the coast. Here we're on some high land and between here and the coast was marshes and Rommel had flooded it all. So that was why the 101st had to capture all this land from here going southwards uh, to allow the men to get off of Utah Beach. Now the plan for the paratroopers was the 101st would be capturing this land plus a lock on the River Douve and some bridges further down. And the 82nd would land further inland. They would capture some Mary Glees and then some bridges over the River Mildere. Now, the 101st were landing around half past one and the 82nd half past two. This is in the middle of the night. Now, 40 minutes before the main body of paratroopers came in, Pathfinders would come in and they'd be teams of them three teams for each landing zone. There were three landing zones for each division and the pathfinders would have to find the drop zone by navigation of course of the pilot and the navigator and land in or as near as they could to the drop zone. And they'd fit up a Eureka beacon which would give out a radio signal and then the planes would come in 42 minutes later in uh, serials. A serial is up to 45 planes flying in uh, formation. Now they form up first three planes in a V and then three V's to make a bigger V. That's nine planes making a big V and then five rows of planes. So that's 45 planes all flying together. They'd home in to the beacon. They'd have a Rebecca receiver on the plane and they'd home into the Eureka beacon and then when they got near the drop zone, they'd see the lights on the ground, which the pathfinders had put up, and all the men would drop, 600 men together. Of course, that was a plan, except when they came across the channel, which of course is that way, the coast over there, came from England to the west of the peninsula, came across this way. They crossed the coast and came into a cloud bank. And so the pilots can see other planes, and so when they came out the clouds, they were all dispersed. And only the lead plane of each nine had the receiver. So then they didn't know where to go, the other planes. That's why men were dropped up to 20 miles off course. So it was generalized chaos. Of course, that was bad news for the individual men who were lost. Could be lost for six days or they could get killed or captured. But it helped the Allies in a way because the Germans finding paratroopers all over the place, they didn't know where to counterattack. So the Germans running in all directions. Now the roads coming off the coast inland were numbered by the Americans. One, two, three, four, coming from near the estuary. One, two, three, and this is exit number four, coming up to St. Martin de Varreville. Of course, Breakout Manor was at the end of exit number two. And exit number two was the main exit for the men coming off Utah Beach because they landed in the wrong place right at the end of exit number two instead of being the exit number three. Lafayette Bridge was one of two bridges crossing the Murderay. They were vital to the advance from Utah to cut off the peninsula before taking Sherbrooke. This bridge was the mission for Lieutenant Dolan of the 505th Regiment of the 82nd Division. Now he landed in the right drop zone between here and St Mary Glees. There were two other misdrop units attacking here, led by Lindquist and Schwarzwald. After fierce fighting, they captured this house by midday. This statue of Iron Mike overlooks the valley, which was completely flooded in 1944. The other side of the river was Corkigny. That was taken without too much trouble by Colonel Timms. His main objective was Amphreville, which is just visible on the skyline. So he left 10 men at Corkigny and set off to Amphreville. By midday, 
Both sides of the river were held by the 82nd men. Around 4 p.m., five Renault tanks and infantry came down the road from Picoville. The ten men at Corquigny had been augmented by stragglers to about 40 men. They managed to knock out two tanks with gamma grenades, but then they were running low on ammo and outnumbered by the infantry. Some men left to join Tim's, some tried to wade across the river and were shot. Fortunately, the men this side of the river had pushed a truck across the road to block it and gliders had already come in bringing in equipment like anti-tank guns. At the bridge there were two bazooka teams and at the high ground on the bend a 50mm gun. Between them they knocked out the three tanks and the Germans retreated. But that wasn't the end of the story. The fighting lasted three days and finished with a charge across the causeway. That would be the subject of another video. So give a thumbs up, subscribe plus the bell to be informed of new videos. Now this road is now called Marcus Heim Way. Marcus Heim was one of the bazooka men. He was just to the left of the road near the bridge with Peterson and he actually ran across the road when they ran out ammunition to get some rockets from the other team and ran back across. Now up there on the corner is where the 57mm gun was also a machine gun there. This is Chef Dupont which was the other vital bridge to be captured. It's flooded a bit like it was in 44. The initial attack was led by Lieutenant Colonel Osterberg. He was wounded in an assault on the bridge. He was trying to get over the humpback bridge as it was then. He was blown off the bridge by a blast into the mud. His men actually laughed the stress of combat. The attacks were then led by Captain Creek. They managed to capture the bridge late in the evening thanks to a glider bringing in a mortar, ammunition and reinforcements. Although they held the bridge, they couldn't advance because of the German artillery on Ile Marie over there. It wasn't until the 9th that the 90th Division arrived with artillery and the deadlock was broken. You can see the other side of the floods is Heron fishing. The owner of this house has made this monument to paratroopers. There's names of lots of paratroopers who fell in the area because there was some of the 101st, mostly 82nd, were in the 82nd's area. De Glopper got the Medal of Honor for his action near La Fier on the 9th. Schlegel was credited as having shot General Falley. It was actually Lieutenant Brannan. Marcus Heim was the bazooka man at La Fier. The road that goes across the bridge is now called Marcus Heim Way. Colonel Shanley was isolated on Hill 30 for some days, not far from here. Hill 30. Of course, there's another Hill 30 near Carentin. The number is the height of the hill in metres. That's why there's more than one. This is a memorial to four C-47s that were shot down in the area. 101st and 82nd. Of course, we're in the 82nd area. This cabinet has a Pratt & Whitney engine in of the C-47. It was a 1,200 horsepower radial engine. Lieutenant Brannan landed some way from here. They didn't know where he was, so with his men they were making their way through the countryside, trying to avoid machine guns. They came down this lane, which happens to be the uh, ground of the Chateau of Berneville, which was General Falley's headquarters, because they didn't know that. They're coming down here, it's about three o'clock in the morning, in the dark. They found some motorcycles parked in the grounds here. So they burst the tyres and smashed the radios because they were military motorcycles. Then they carried on down this lane. So Lieutenant Brannan and his men are coming down this road after passing the wall of the chateau. And they get to this house. This is after three in the morning. So they knock on the door of the house. 
and they wake the family up. The father comes and opens the door and they ask him where they are. They show him their map, which they all had, and he points out that they're at Picoville. So now they know where they are. But then they hear a sound of a car coming down the road and uh, they try and stop it by firing at it and the car continues and then it crashes into the house. Now the driver jumped out and tried to get down into the cellar of the building. The officer in the front was killed. The officer in the back was thrown out onto the road and he was trying to get his Luger so Lieutenant Brannan shot him. And then they looked into his briefcase and found that that was actually General Fally. Now he'd been on his way to the war games organized at Rennes, which is another lucky stroke for the Allies. But he saw lots of planes going over. He thought this isn't normal. So he decided to come back. Now the entrance to the chateau is at the far end of the lane on the main road. But he didn't go in the entrance. He came around here because further down here, there was his uh, truck that had all his equipment in. It was his sort of mobile command truck. So that's why he was coming down here. And he had the bad chance to be the first German general to be killed on D-Day. He should have gone on to Rennes. Now he was the commander of the 91st Air Landing Division, which actually meant anti-air landing division. And so they were without their leader and that put them into confusion. So the lane is named after Jack Schlegel. He was one of the men with Lieutenant Bannon. And Jack Schlegel was actually credited as having shot General Fally, but it was actually Lieutenant Brannan. We're here at St Mary Glees, and one strange incident happened here due to uh, an accident. There was a fire broke out in the house over there by the museum. And so the people of the town were woken up. And there was a curfew on during the war. So after eight o'clock at night, everybody was indoors. But the Germans got the bells ringing on the church to wake everybody up to come and fight the fire. And then amongst all the chaos of firefighting, two plane loads of men were dropped right into town. Now it's only a hypothesis, but it's possible that the fire confused the pilots who were lost into thinking it was a marker of a landing zone. So these two plane loads of men were dropped here, that's 36 men, and one man dropped right in the fire, and the famous John Steele got caught up on top of the church. Now in The Longest Day they showed that, they actually filmed it here, and it was he was played by Red Buttons, and in the film, he gets caught up on the church and then he's trying to cut himself free and he drops his knife and a German hears the knife fall and looks up and shoots at him and he gets a bullet in the foot. Now he did get a bullet in the foot but it didn't happen like that. He got the bullet in his foot as he was coming down on his parachute and then he hung there playing dead hoping nobody would shoot at him. Now he nearly did get shot because one man fell on the ground near the church, that uh, was John Ray. Another man was caught on the roof of the church, that was Ken Russell. Now John Ray was shot by a German and the German who shot him was turning to shoot Ken Russell and John Steele. But John Ray got his pistol out and shot the German. But he died from his wounds, John Ray that is. Now Ken Russell hanging over the side of the roof, he could cut himself free and he jumped down off the roof and uh, got out of town. Of course, John Steele had to stay up there. He was finally taken down by the two Germans. Now, there's two mistakes with the parachute. One is that it's white. That's used a green camouflage one. And the other mistake with the dummy hanging up there is that he didn't actually land there. He landed the other side of the tower. But we wouldn't see him if he was hung up there. So they've hung up the dummy this side. Another strange thing happened here on D-Day. After all the chaos of firefighting, the German garrison thought that was the end of the war and they went back to bed. And so Lieutenant Colonel Krauss, whose job it was to take the town, he actually landed in the right place, which is over there, about a mile and a half. 
and at half past four in the morning he walked in with 600 men and just took the town with a small skirmish. And of course, when things go easy, they get difficult afterwards because they had to defend the place from German counterattacks afterwards, but the Germans never got back in again. Now there's some marks here of uh, machine gun bullets you know, in the plane. There's other bullet marks on the wall. And here there's actually a bullet in the wall still. And another bullet hole just there with no bullet. This is the first Danglast window to have paratroopers in it. It's paid for by the townspeople, 1947. See, there's three paratroopers in it. Now this stained glass window was paid for by veterans in 1969 for the 25th anniversary. It's got St Michael in it, because he's the patron saint of paratroopers. There's the AA badge on the left, for the 82nd. That means all American. And on the right, the ready. That's the badge of the 505th. Then there's the symbols of the different campaigns they're in. At the top, the olive branch is for Italy. At the bottom left, cross to Lorraine for France. The lion at the top left for Belgium. And the tulip on the right for Holland.